in you by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seeing, this qualifies it, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Father, bless your holy word now. Thy name I pray, man. The book of Hebrews is full of a lot of theological, deep theological, uh, how would you say it, arguments. And the writer puts forth these and then he shows you how that the Lord Jesus Christ is the completion, satisfaction, consummation for all of it. That without the Lord Jesus Christ, you have all these broken ends, no end to it, and there's nowhere to turn. But with him, you have God's statement and the finish of what the Old Testament uh, could only talk about. But Christ is the completion of it. In verse number 25, I call your attention to this word. He is able to save to the uttermost, uttermost, uttermost. The Greek word translated uttermost is pantelis. It's a conjunction of two words, ponte and telos. Have you ever heard of Pan American Airlines? Those of you that lived years ago, Pan means over and complete all over everything. Pan American Airlines, the first one to travel around the world to provide aircraft uh, uh, service for people. So the word Pan has come down into our, 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 our language today, vocabulary to understand that it is something that moves across a wide space, okay? Covers a wide area, Pan-American. And telos means a completed, absolute finished thing that cannot be added to. In another place in the New Testament, it is translated, he will not, he will not, he will not, uh, he, he uh, in no wise will cast out, in no wise. Think about that now. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. So what you have here is a completion, a statement of absolute completion. When it has to do with his salvation. The Lord saves two lives when he saves you. He saved your first one when he saved your soul and wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. That's the new birth. That's a one-time thing. It cannot be improved upon. It cannot be changed. He that is born of the Spirit is spirit. But you have to live out a life in this world. And that life that you live out in this world has to do with his ministry before God right now on your behalf. This is why it says in Hebrews 7, he ever liveth to make intercession. And it has to do with salvation. It has not to do with salvation for eternity, but it has to do with salvation for your life. I've known Christians that I believe at one time loved the Lord and now they're living on the street. Their life was cut short. Their life was ruined, and the reason it was is because they turned it over to Satan instead of trusting the Lord with their life. When you're born again, my dear friend, when you come to know Christ, that's the beginning, the beginning of your relationship with the Lord. You can do nothing in this world to add to your salvation. You cannot do anything in this world to merit God's salvation. It is the free gift of God. Amen. And I'm thankful for that today. So the writer of Hebrews says that he is able to save to the uttermost. An absolute, complete, full salvation that has to do with every part of your being and your nature and what makes you what you are. When a building is finished, we understand it's complete. Started from a cornerstone. When a ship is christened, have you ever seen them christen a ship? You ever notice the word christened? What's that connected with? It's connected with Christ, amen? Amen, it's sent out with the anointing of Christ upon this ship. Uh, when a diploma or a degree is achieved, we have those in the house today, you've completed something, you've achieved it. And when a debt is paid in full, you will usually get a paper from the lender saying that this is paid now, you owe no more on it. And then when Christ died on the cross, he died for a complete salvation. Amen. He didn't leave it in your hands. He paid for it. Therefore, all sin, past, present, and future will never be paid for. You can't pay for it. You don't have anything to pay for it with. But Christ paid for your sins. That's what makes it so wonderful that he's already paid the sin debt. 
He paid the sin debt. He satisfied the justice of a thrice holy God. He sealed Satan's defeat at the cross. In the Old Testament times, the king would wear a ring. He'd put it into some kind of a clay upon the seal, and he'd put his mark upon it, sometimes more than once. And that would be broken at the pain of death. Only the receiver could receive that. At the cross at Calvary, God put his mark on Satan, and nothing will break that. He defeated him, made a show of him openly there at the cross at Calvary. And then he proved his love for us, my dear friend, when he died. It wasn't all talk. I've known a lot of people that are all talk. Amen. Amen. You ever heard this? You can talk a good job, but you can't do it. Well, a lot of people are all talk. Talk is cheap. Talk is very cheap. He proved what he said by his love at the cross. He'll save you from yourself. My dear friend, your greatest enemy is you. Amen. You, 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 you. Sometimes your past will wear you out. Amen. It'll eat you up. Eat you up. As much as you try to forget it, put it away, and let the past be the past. My dear friend, it's still there in your memory banks. And what you've done, what you have to understand is that when he saved you, he made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not what you used to be. He'll save you from your failures. A lot of people, they'll try, they'll fail, and they'll never try again. My dear friend, Thomas Edison failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed failed till he created a light bulb that was able to burn for years and years and years. And they have light bulbs in Florida that have been burning for 60, 70 years. Amen. But you can't buy them because they're not making any money like that. Thomas Edison, he said, and they said, what is, how how do you do it? Is it inspiration? No, it's perspiration. You put work into it. He'll save you from your fears. A lot of people are scared to death of all the wrong things. They're afraid of everything. My friend, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear him, he said, that is able to take the body and soul and put it into hell fire. And then the mind, the mind, the mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. The way you think controls the way you live. What you feed into your mind is going to have a profound effect upon how you relate to the world and see yourself and see God and see Christ. Your mind is a thing that God's given you. An animal doesn't have a mind like you've got. They say animals live by instinct. What do they live by? They cannot reach up into heaven and they cannot see Christ at the right hand of God the Father. They will never be able to see that, but that's your heritage, the mind of Christ. So he saves you from a bad mind. Don't listen to the wrong people. Don't run with the wrong crowd. Don't listen to all the, everybody today has got an opinion. Amen. If you have an opinion, tell me something. What's it based on? Amen. Because it's awfully easy to give out all kind. He saves you from your enemy, which is Satan. Satan, Satan, the adversary. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in your good works. Amen. No. How many caught me? Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are in your brethren that are in the world. The faith is a wonderful, blessed gift from God. God gives some people great faith and they're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, faith to move mountains. But we all have a measure of faith, the scripture says, every one of us. And this faith is a plea, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So your adversary, the devil wants to pursue, he wants to devour you. Let me give you this this morning. How do you know you're being devoured by Satan? How do you know it? Well, number one, you have no compassion Your compassion has left you. You can't feel the sufferings of other people, their sorrow, their pain. When they put up a hand for a prayer request, it didn't do anything for you. I saw a movie about 50 years ago that had to do with World War II, and they were moving people on a train. And this little child fell out of the train. It fell out of an open door, fell out and obviously died. And the mother began to scream. And the people just sat there as if nothing had happened. Because of what they've been through. They've been through so much hell that they had hardened themselves. Don't let your heart become hardened to this world. It's full of suffering. The longer you live, the more suffering you're going to see. You have in America kids that are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. From day one, they have all the privileges. They've got everything they want. And I'll tell you right now, I mean, you wouldn't believe how they grow up. And truth of the matter is most of them never grow up. When they're born with a silver. But then you have areas of this country like Mumbai, India, for example. 
born in a slum. I mean a filthy, sorry slum. Born to a prostitute in a slum. Never have any more than filth. And my dear friend, there's a difference between the two, isn't there? Yeah. Amen. God will give you wisdom once you understand there's a difference between the two. Yeah. But he's the same God over all, is he not? Amen. God Almighty's God. Nothing happens. Amen. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So here you are today living in an affluent country. Are you thankful for it? Yeah. I'm thankful I was not born in India, in Mumbai especially. Yeah. I'm thankful I was not born in some kind of a hell hole like that. I'm not saying all of India is like that, but they have their areas, my dear friend. I'm glad I wasn't born there, aren't you? No forgiveness. This is how you know that Satan's eating you up and devouring you. If somebody does something to you, you become a cynic about it. You don't, there's no, you can't forgive. And it's, and it's, and it's literally consuming your soul. You go into your prayer closet and you carry all this baggage in there with you. You can't get a hold of God. And the reason you cannot get a hold of him is because you're so full of hate, yeah, amen. have no compassion, yeah. and you can't forgive. Yeah. Oh, if you could only see what all God forgave me for. If you only opened up my closet, I'd have more bones flying out there than any of you. I'd make you all look bad. But God's good. He's good. He's gracious and long-suffering. Amen, amen, amen. I am not what I used to be. How many times I say, I know it, devil, that's truth. Everything you said's true. All of the path, that's true, Satan. You were right there. You understand all of it. But let me tell you something, devil. I am not what I used to be. Amen. 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 Do you judge your relationship with other people by their past? Do you dig into somebody's past and begin to set them aside and make a second-class Christian out of them? My dear friend, every one of us came the same way under the same blood from the same cross and the same Christ. In the eyes of God, if you're born again, he doesn't have a big one or a little one. We're all the same. Aren't you glad for that? Amen, 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 amen. No love. You don't love anything. Satan is consuming you. You've lost your love. The only thing you love is yourself. No faith. Your faith's gone. You know, you just live by, by, by the same thing an animal lives by. You're surviving week after week after week. Are you like that? I mean, you know, your joy has gone completely from you. You're letting Satan devour you. All of that. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't. In India, they have a caste system. Caste system is where you're born into a class. And they, if you read some of the promos from India, you'll hear them high, high brow talk. Oh, our caste system now is gone. It's, it, no, it's not, dear friend. It's as real there as it ever has been. And at the lowest point of that caste system, the bottom of the rung, they're called the untouchables. They're the ones who clean human excrement. They're the bottom. You can't even touch them. You don't want them around. They're nothing but pure filth. And how come? Because of their karma. Because of their karma. They had lived a previous life and now they're paying for it. And so what do you do if you're in India? You do good. You work at it. You, you want a better karma when you come back the next time. And you hear them in this country using karma all the time. Amen. It's become a popular word in America. And my dear friend, you don't want any karma. Karma's got nothing to do with me. For by grace are you saved through faith. Gift of God, not of works lest any man should be. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. No, karma doesn't, karma doesn't judge and, and direct my life. He worketh in me, and he will work in me until he calls me. And when he calls me, I'll say hello and goodbye in the same word. Amen. See you later, alligator. Meet you by the river. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen, amen. They have a system. It's called the caste system, the untouchables. I don't know if you've ever heard of an aghori or not. An aghori is a part of the religious system of India. And unless you have a strong stomach, you wouldn't want to hear what I have to say about them. If you want to do your own research into it, you'll be amazed at how they have a fixation with death. But it goes much deeper than that. They're filthy, unbelievably filthy. Just imagine in your mind this morning the filthiest thing you possibly can and you'll get a hold of what I'm talking about. Just a few days ago, this family was arrested, my husband and wife. Their daughter had sat on a sofa 
She'd sat there for 12 years, and she was, she was handicapped. And, she, and, and when they walked into that building and found that girl, she had been dead. And the coroner said, I couldn't sleep for two weeks after seeing what I saw. She was literally in her own filth. You on? Are you following me now? That's the aghore. But this is the thing I'm talking about today. This filth, this fixation with death is what goes on in the world. Why is it? Why do they have a fixation with? Because they're dead. That's why. The demoniac of Gadara. Where did they find him? Where was he? He was in the tombs. Death. There's a god over there in India called Kali. Kali. You ought to see some pictures of Kali. She's something to see. Her devotees were called thuggies. Thuggy. Thuggy. That's where we get our English word thug. Comes directly from there. These people were devoted to Kali. What'd they do? They killed. They would join up with the caravan at night and they'd go with them so far and then when the caravan was sleeping, they'd rise up and slaughter them. Why? Because they fixation in death. It's about death. It's all about death. That's all they knew. They were worshiping Kali by killing. The British were in there and they came to, finally they began to try to wipe it out, do what they could. They came to one and said, if you'll simply renounce your following of Kelly, we won't hang you on this gallows. And he looked at them and he said, I'll hang. And even at that, he would hang because of his fixation with Kelly. When they march in the streets and they carry their signs and say, I have this my woman's body. I have a right, I have a right, I have a right. Have you noticed how that it's all about them and never about the baby? Have you ever noticed they have a fixation about death? These are dead people. They're dying people. It's about killing. CBS, NBC, and ABC, and CNN, the rest of them will never give you that. But when you're killing babies, you're killing folks. They have a fixation with death. Why, that? why preacher? Because Satan is a killer. That's why. The book says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse number 28, have no cuttings in the flesh for the dead. You see, you have to understand some history, biblical history, to understand what's going on. God reached into the midst of paganism and called Abraham out. Then he had a family, and they were surrounded with every kind of human sacrifice and paganism you can imagine, and he called them out. And he gave them the word of God, and he said, this is your life. Keep it. And so he says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, 26 and verse number 14, may have no ought for the dead. You know what that means? That means don't worship the dead, your ancestors. Don't worship your ancestors and make no baldness between your eyes. And there are many more passages there. Why? Because an unsaved dead man has a fixation with death. Yes. Amen. Amen. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you come to life. What you, hear, what you were hearing sung in this house this morning was about life, Amen. not about death. Amen. 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 The Bible talks about folly. You look up the word folly and it literally means stupidity. That's right. You can educate ignorant, but there's not a lot you can do with stupid. That's right. Amen. And we're all ignorant. Amen. We're all ignorant. Everyone, every last one of them. I don't care if you've got a PhD, 15 degrees. We are ignorant of something. Amen. Nobody knows everything. Amen. So you can educate ignorant. There are many things I need to learn. To be taught. God teaches. I, I want to learn. I'm a, I'm a student. I'm, I, my mind's open. Teach me. But I don't want to be stupid. Because stupid is the complete opposite of the knowledge and will of God. So how do you know you're, how do you know you're stupid? Well, let's look at the awakened sinner. The awakened sinner. Now, the Bible said the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel shine in them, they should believe. So the sinner is blinded, he's not awakened. But if he is awakened, he realizes he got a problem. Amen. An awakened sinner, he's got a problem. What's going on? God woke me up in 1973. Yeah. Amen. He awakens you. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. Well, some run away. They do what Jonah did. They start running. What are they doing? Running from God. That's stupid. He can run faster than you. He can get there before you get there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> then there are those that hide. 
like Saul did. The Bible said he was head and shoulders taller than the rest of them, but he was hiding among the stuff when they were calling the tribes out to be the next, the first king of Israel. Yeah. They hide. There's a lot of things people hide behind, but they hide. Then they make excuses. The awakened sinner likes to make excuses. What's that? Adam said, Lord, this woman you gave me messed up my relationship with you. If you hadn't given me that woman, I could be walking with you right now. We'd be having fellowship. God said, I'm going to have any part of it, Adam. You're responsible for what you did. You make your own choices. You make your own choices. Quit blaming everybody else for what you are. Stop it. That's the blame game. You ever heard anybody say, the devil made me do it? You ever heard that? That's about as low as it gets. Accept responsibility for your actions. I did it. I did it. Satan might have had a part in temptation, but I did it. I made the choice in what I did. And then there are those who try to cover it up. They cover it up. Oh, yeah, they, co they cover up. They cover up. They're awakened sinners, but they try. Well, you know, they say, well, you know, have you ever heard a nice religious prayer? I've heard some beautiful religious prayers. Oh, my, just turn your toenails up. Listen to some of these beautiful religious prayers. Lord, I thank thee I'm not as other men. Lord, you've been good to me. And, and I just I want to praise you for you've, been, I've been, you've done so much for me. And, and I'm just here today to give you glory and all. Uh, why don't you thank him for what he's saved you from? That you're not that anymore. And don't get up with a bunch of religious junk in God's face. Just admit, admit it. You know why you don't do it? It's a simple reason. There's a simple reason for all the problems of man. It's just one simple little word. P-R-I, what's the last two? That's it, pride. Goeth before a fall and haughty spirit before destruction. Pride was the devil's fall, so beautiful. And then there are those who finally take a lofty position when they're awakened sinner. Well, now, you know, Lord, huh, don't you appreciate all the stuff I look at these organizations I belong to? I'm a very, very benevolent. Now, I give to charities every year and all this and all this and this and that and this and that. Where do people hide, folks? They hide behind religion. They hide behind religion. Amen. Amen. Have you ever, have you ever seen anybody in church that's never really opened their mouth and confessed their I heard a brother son over here a, minute, here a few days ago and gave his testimony. He confessed to some things. Have you ever given your testimony? Amen. You ever given your testimony? Yeah. Yeah. You hear me do it all the time. This 15 months I spent in Okinawa, you wouldn't believe who I was in Okinawa. Yeah. Be glad, I wasn't, Amen. that's not me. That's right. You were in Korea. Yes. You're not the same you were in Korea. Amen. I've been, cha I've been saved. I've been changed. That way I can relate. If you're a sorry, low down piece of garbage and deserve hell and you're no good, you're no good, you're not, I relate to you. <laughs> I understand you. If you think you're in some kind of religious, clean, you know, holy crowd here, everybody got their nose up in the air, that's death. That's death. Some people hide behind their reputation. What all they've done for God, what all they've done for Christ. It's good. I mean, when you acknowledge that you've done something, people acknowledge it. And I believe in that, just like we did this morning, Sunday school. Acknowledge the hard work that goes into teaching these kids. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But there are those full of their pride and full of themselves that they figure, well, I've done all this for God. He must. The person, people hide behind people. This is one of the worst of all. And this is the most subtle of all, I guess. You say, what do you mean hide behind people? You ever known a fornicating preacher? You ever known an adulterous preacher? You ever known a deacon run off somebody's wife? You ever seen somebody absconded with a pile of money from a church? You ever seen that kind of stuff go on in a church house? Yeah. You ever seen it go on? Yeah. It goes on all the time. I'm up here preaching to you this morning. There may be some affairs going on right now in here. I don't know anything about them. I don't have to know about it, but I know this. I know your people. Your people. The church has got everything in the world going on inside. Yes, it does. Well, I'll find me a perfect church. No, you won't. <laughs> As the old country boy said, the minute you walk through the door, it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> Amen. No, it's not perfect, folks. It's sinners that want fellowship with God and they want to come by the way of the cross. 
They want the blood to cleanse their soul and their spirit. They know what they are and where they came from. And they know if it wasn't for the grace of God, they'd be in hell. They know that. And they want to come and they want to worship the Lord. And they've got besetting sins. And they want to bring them before God. And they want the grace of God to give them the strength they need to deal with you. You ever been hurt? You ever been hurt? You ever been hurt in church? There are people out there that won't darken a church door haven't 20 or 30 years. You know why? Because they got hurt bad. Real bad. They got hurt real bad in church. That should be the last place in the world you should get hurt. You see? A few years ago, I heard about a church, I don't know if it's here in Knoxville or somewhere, said that they were so mad at each other, they were up screaming across from one side of the church to the other. I don't know what it's about, but that's what was going on inside that church. I've been in church dogfights. I hadn't been saved long until I was right smack in the middle of a dogfight right in church. I thought, man, I left this when I left the bars down there in Okinawa. That's what we did down there. Amen, before I got saved. And then here it is right smack in the church. And man, I'm telling you right now, there was some old hatred, all some old grudges. There's, there's, they, they, they were just coming out. You could tell, boy, they're fire in their eyes. This is my opportunity. I'm going to get you. And they did. They did. And people get hurt. Have you been hurt in church? Just keep this in mind. The Bible said in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. This will help you if you've been hurt. So what do you do, preacher? This will, this, this will help you because it helps me. When I start, uh, I, I, when every preacher does, he gets, in, he gets in a position sometimes where he's, He's not, uh, he, 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 these spiritual powers are coming down on him. I don't, that's the only way I know to put it. So what do you do? How do you come out of there? Well, you can't pull yourself out of there. You can't do it. You don't have the power to do it. But here's what will work. Focus your mind on Christ. And here's what to focus. Focus your mind on the Lord Jesus. Get your mind off people. Maybe it's people you love, you respect, and all and that's all good. But get your mind off of people. And focus it on the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus it on his obedience. The Bible said he made himself of no reputation. He really did that, folks. Focus your mind upon his compassion. You remember blind Bartimaeus sat by the roadside down there in Jericho? Loud Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Shut up! They said to him, you're bothering the master. Who do you think you are anyhow? Be quiet. He wouldn't shut up. He said, you shut up. <laughs> Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. That's how you get stuff done with God. Amen. I, that's why I love Bartimaeus. He wouldn't be shut up. Nobody could shut him up. <laughs> and boy, he cried out. And what happened to him? Did his crying out to God do anything for him? Well, of course it did. And then we have wisdom. Do you want to? If you want to come out of it, focus your mind on Christ and his yeah. wisdom. So what is that? When he met with the Pharisees in John chapter number 8, this is the organized religion of his day. It did not represent all. No. Nathaniel was, was an Israelite in whom was no guile. But it represented a lot of them. Here's what he said. You're your father, the devil. And the works of your father you'll do. He was a murderer, a liar from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And so he dealt with them, John 8. You can read it there. That eighth chapter of John is one of the most scathing rebukes you'll find in the whole Bible. And what did he do? He said, this is religion. Religion is ever the enemy of the gospel of Christ and the truth. So God, give you, ask God to give you wisdom. Ask him to give you wisdom, discernment, to pick that out and understand it. Then there's graciousness. I love this. If you'll focus your mind on Christ, you'll see a gracious one. Amen. He's gracious. He's gracious. When he rose from the dead, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. I don't care where you have to hunt. I don't care how long you have to hunt. I don't care where you're going to find him. I want you to get a hold of Peter. It doesn't make any difference. If it takes a week, a month, I want Peter. You tell Peter that I've arisen from the dead. Oh, boy. I don't know where they found him. I don't have any idea. But they found him. You ever been out there with Peter? 
Well, a good night. Man, I've been out there with him. I've been everywhere Peter's been. Yeah, been out there. And he found me. I leave the 90 and 9 and go find that one. And he's got 90 and 9 back here, but he's rejoicing on that one. He brings it back. I've been out there. You ever been out there? Some of you are out there right now. And he's calling on you and he's speaking to your soul and he wants you to come home. Amen. He wants you to come home. You come home. Amen. Quit fighting him. Amen. He's the lover of your soul. Get your eyes off people. He'll bind up your wounds. He will. He'll bind them up. But come home. Come home. Come home. There's the love of the Father. He said, Father, forgive them. I do believe that when the Lord Jesus said that from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He looked right down into the eyes of the one holding the hammer that had driven the nails through his hands. He said, Father, forgive them. I don't see how in the world somebody could stand that and pass through it. Then focus your mind upon his majesty. Seated at the right hand of the Father. He'll never die again, folks. That's finished. He's coming back as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And man, I want to come back on that day. I want to see power and glory and holiness come out of heaven. Amen. I want to see the battle of Armageddon because I already know who's going to win that battle. I know who's coming. And then finally, focus your eyes upon Christ and his divine will. He worketh all things. What about the stuff that I hate? He'll still work it. Nothing can happen to a Christian that God cannot turn to good. It might have meant, been meant for evil. It might be evil, but he can turn it to good. And you remember Joseph said, you meant evil toward me, but God sent me before you. Joseph told his people that. He said, if I hadn't been in Egypt, you'd starve to death. But God was in it, and he delivered you through me. God used Joseph, and Joseph hurt, felt the pain. He felt the hurt. I believe the greatest pain Joseph felt was not when he was locked up or when he was carried off or when he was put in the dungeon. The greatest pain that Joseph felt was in his heart because his brethren had betrayed him. There's no greater pain. There's no greater pain. To heal the brokenhearted. Bow your head with me. Father, Lord, I've done what a messenger does. That's what I am. I'm the messenger, Lord. I've done what you, what you tell me to do. Lord, I can't do anything any more to help somebody than to give them the truth. If somebody in here this morning needs to move, they need to come down here. because Not because we, we talk about people moving. We don't do that. But because they need help. This was given to help somebody. Speak to their hearts and move in their soul. Why, why are your heads bowed right now? Would you raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, I'm out there. I, am. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know I know the Lord. But I need to come home. I need to come home. Pray for me. God bless you right there. God bless you. I need to come home. God bless you over there. Amen. God bless your soul. God bless you for acknowledging it. I'm your friend. You didn't come in here to condemn you. We came in here to help you. Anybody else raise your hand and say, that's me, preacher. I'm out there with Peter right now. I'm out there. Imagine how Peter felt. God bless you back there. Imagine how Peter felt. Why, good night. He denied the Lord. He went away from there and wept, wept bitterly. My, my, my. I'm sure he said to himself, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I could do something like that. But he did it. But it didn't change the love of Christ for him. Anybody else raise your hand and say, Lord Jesus, I'm out there with Peter. I'm out there with him. Peter's my brother. Peter's my brother. And Peter was the Lord's disciple, apostle, no question. But you saw what happened to him. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me? All right, God bless you there. God bless you. Father, I pray now, in Jesus' name, you get the glory this morning. Glorify thyself. As our Lord prayed in John 17, glorify thyself with the glory that you had before I came into this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand up here and sing, brother.